Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's conversation is a little different than what you might be used to on our podcast. The assault on the family is as prominent today as it has ever been. Divorce rates, even among the most committed Christians, are still at unacceptably high levels, creating ripple effects for generations. The United States currently ranks sixth in the world in the highest percentages of divorce. While we won't solve any of that in today's episode, this podcast will occasionally explore successful marriages in hopes that God speaks through these marriages to help create stronger marriages for our listeners, whether you're currently married or will be someday. Today, Cal and Vicki Holt have agreed to open some of the doors of their marriage in an effort to share some of the elements that have helped them have a successful marriage for more than 45 years. No one on today's episode is a trained marriage counselor, so please don't consider anything you hear today to be professional advice on marriage. It's simply a conversation about marriage that might be a blessing to your marriage. Welcome to A Stronger Faith, a podcast where everyday people share real experiences that transform their faith. I'm your host, Stacy McCants, and we pray that God uses this conversation to move you in your pursuit of a stronger faith. Today, Cal and Vicki Holt answer some challenging questions on marriage and provide priceless insights as to how they've enjoyed a successful marriage for more than 45 years. I have uh, had this pressing on me for a while about talking about topics that are important in our culture and our society from a faith perspective, at not the least of which of ranking of importance, I think, personally, is marriage. Uh, there are statistics, and I think, it's, I think it's dropping from what I've read a little bit on the chances of divorce, but up until a few years ago, that number was right around 50%, like 50% of all marriages ended in divorce. Now, that, in, that includes second marriages, third marriages, and that sort of thing. So I think the number of first marriages that ended in divorce was less. It was probably 40 maybe just sub 40, and you guys may know the numbers better than I do. Um, second marriages was at around a 60% rate. Third marriages at about 75% rate. Um, and when you look at it, the numbers from a faith-based perspective, uh, there are some that indicate that it's not too terribly different for Christians. There are some that, that show maybe a, a little more marked um, decrease in the divorce rate among Christians. But what most of those find, well, the research that I've seen, is that with Christians, the, in the research they call them devout, right? So it's, it's people that I would say that probably have more of a daily walk with God um, tend to be significantly mm-hmm. less. And, um, but still, even at 25%, that's, w- that's one in every four marriages mm-hmm. of people of faith, Jesus followers, with daily meditation, walk, scripture, prayer, still getting divorced. And so, you know, none of us here are, Vicki, you may be because you, you're um, multi-talented and all these things, but um, I am certainly no professional in this arena. I'm just a guy in Alabama that likes to have conversations with people about faith and their faith experiences. Um, so this episode is nothing, it, this is this is a conversation with a married couple who's been married for a very long time, whose marriage has stood the test of time. Um, and, and it's an effort to find out how that happened quite honestly. So Cal and Vicki Holt, uh, you guys have been friends and we've been church members together for a while. And I see you guys with some frequency. And when I began to think of marriages that I thought were, um, models, at least for us, you came to mind. So, um, I appreciate you accepting the invitation to come in and have a conversation about marriage. It's kind of humbling to be, um, asked to do something like this uh, because I don't know that I've ever, we have a strong marriage. We all, we always have. And sometimes I think maybe we don't 
have any advice for anybody else, but I guess we do. Well, I'm going <laughs> to come up with... We've been married for 45 years. 45 years. 45 years. And I, and I do think the um, odds probably were against us because we were so young when we got married. I was 20. Cal was 21? Two. You were 22. Okay. So, um, yeah, because I was almost 21. So, um, I think the odds really were against us being that young and... But I will tell you the saving grace right off the bat was we moved from the state of Arkansas to Alabama. So we weren't, and we didn't really know anyone here. So we didn't have anybody to run home to (laughs) when there were problems. Well, I'll probably ask some questions about um, the good stuff too, for sure. And I don't think people struggle so much with that. Yeah. Um, It's some of the tough stuff that people tend to struggle with. You got a divorce rate clipping at 40 and 50%. You've been around and you've been married for 45 years. You've had lots of friends. I'm sure you've seen successful marriages and some not so successful marriage. Why do you think it is that we're, we're still at such a high divorce rate? Well, you know, as we were dating and getting to know each other and talking about those things we believed in, Divorce was one of the things we did not believe in. We just didn't think that was an option and that we would do everything that we were capable of to prevent that. Uh, And I think early on that's important to have those conversations of, I think sometimes divorce ends up being because you didn't communicate very well about um, whatever your needs or your concerns or... uh, philosophies or anything like that Uh, the fact that you can't talk to each other is problematic when you're first married you're in love you know you is a this gooey thing that goes on and oh we'll never get married and you make promises including your wedding vows but you also have conversations then it's like hey you know we have to come first you know we when we have kids or careers or whatever we have to put each other as number one, and um, we have to commit that we're not going to get divorced, kind of like you said right there. And a lot of those things are said and easily in, in the moment of youth and mm-hmm. the excitement of marriage, and you know, all of a sudden you're kind of, the play in house is like real. Um, it's the new thing. It's the nudeness, and the nudeness gets you excited. Yeah. Um, it's, it's after the nudeness is not new anymore. Or there are things that seem to happen that that um, that cause us to not always hold on to those idealistic right. thoughts that we had early on. Did that just not happen for you? I I, I think ahead. you get caught up in the todayness. What's going on in your life today? And life kind of gets in the way. Kids get in the way. Jobs get in the way. All lots of things can, um, inter- interfere. Um, and, and I think that we get selfish. We get into our own mode of, uh, you know, it doesn't, I, I'm, I'm worried about my job. I don't really care about him. I'm worried about my job. And, uh, and I've got so much to do and, you know, everything he does just drives me crazy. So I, I think it's easy to fall into that trap and then the everydayness, it kind of goes like that. So it takes pulling back and, um, remembering, uh, what, you know, why we are together and that actually he, he might actually be able to help me deal with what I'm going through at work or um, if I will allow him that instead of just ignoring him or thinking he's more trouble than <laughs> you're just more trouble than it's worth right now. I've just got so much to do. Just, you know, can't you do your own laundry? You know, it's, it's, you know, that kind of stuff. But yeah, we went through all that. Sure. You know, it's our, our story is a little different. It's like everybody's story has their own differences. Um, we did not not date long before I moved from Arkansas to Tuscaloosa. And that story is a God 
thing in itself. It just happened. I didn't look f- to move to Tuscaloosa. It just happened in like a four-day period of time, and that's a whole nother hmm. episode. So we did not see each other often for nine months prior to getting married. And in fact, did not see each other for three months before the day before the wedding. And uh, so when we did get married and all of a sudden moved to Alabama from our homes in Arkansas, we were on our own. No, no doubt about that. And we had to survive. We had to learn each other's personalities and, and likes and dislikes. Uh, unfortunately for Vicky, I grew up a spoiled, rotten youngest child <laughs> and mentoring uh, from the baby boomer generation after World War II where the father worked, the mother didn't. You know, I didn't have a clue what to expect from a, a wife and mother to be at some point as to what they did. All I knew is the dad worked and came home and didn't do anything. That's what I saw. So I was so ignorant of that, uh, didn't know how to communicate it. And it took some harsh lessons early on of really being unfair to Vicky. Um, in my practices of going around with friends and doing things and not including her. And uh, she worked, uh, and I worked and went to school, and we didn't see each other that often. At times she'd come in, I'd go out and that kind of thing. And that's tough on an early, early marriage. And I guess after year one, there were different things that were challenging to a marriage that took place. And we decided, you know what, let's go to church. Was was faith just a huge part of life growing up for you guys, and it just carried over into marriage, or did you find it anew when you decided to get married and, and that sort of thing? I think we, uh, on my part, it was finding something anew. Now, um, I did go to church, and my mother took us to church in Sunday school. My father did not um, go often, um, and there was not a lot of talk about faith in our church. I mean, in in my family, although, um, my mother tells me that my dad's family always thought he would be a minister when he grew up. I thought that was interesting. He ended up being a banker, but you know, my parents were very kind and, and I know that there's, um, I I know they had a spirituality about them. I, I, I know that, uh, although they didn't really, We didn't talk about it much, you know, but I was involved in church and Sunday school and youth group and all of that kind of stuff. Um, But I don't know that I really truly understood it. I mean, it was, and I actually, I was Methodist. He was Presbyterian. I just figured we would be Methodist because I was. (laughs) Don't they usually follow the brides? Yeah, uh, that's what I thought. But I will say that once, you know, we ended up being Presbyterian, and then I realized, oh, yeah, I was always supposed to be Presbyterian. This is, you know, this is really... You were predestined to be I was predestined to, to be, because it's <laughs> like, okay, this Amen. this makes sense to me, and, um, and okay, you can tell a little bit more about why we ended up at the Presbyterian Church. Okay. First, let me say that my background from a faith situation, um, my family was very involved in church up until I turned 14, and my father passed away unexpectedly. And my mother really struggled with that. So we didn't go to church a lot after that. However, my grandmother had a huge influence on my life, and I was fortunate enough to spend the summers with her from the seventh grade all the way through the 11th grade. And we went to church on Sunday. We went to church on Wednesday. She would have me read the Bible to her at night under the premise she was too busy to read it herself. Mm. Would you read it for me? It only took me 10 years later to figure out what she had done. (laughs) So a great influence on that. The Lord just kind of took us through experiences, and it was through people that we had met along the way that we met Dr. Charles McCain. And it was through his daughter and future son-in-law at the time, um, that introduced us to Dr. McCain, and he had such a physical presence. And he invited us there to church. 
And so we visited there, and they were just some wonderful couples that just took us under their wing and, and hugged us and loved on us and looked after us and checked on us. It, it just felt like home. We talk about the successes of marriages for people who are of stronger faith uh, typically survive more often. That's the numbers show that. And so I'm wondering, you know, did you bring, was this a, a faith formed marriage or is this two people that were in love and then, you know, we got to make it on our own. We should go find a church and that sort of thing. Former or latter? I think it's the latter. I, I, I think we both came from um, church you know, quotes here on my part, uh, church families. And, and I think that we knew that that's where we would in, end up. I think, I think we knew that. I, I also think had I married somebody who um, did not have a strong faith and did not um, see that impor- important, I think I could have gone down that path as well. Right. I do think it, it was all a God thing that we were to be married and we were to, to you know, go to this church and that we would find um, through faith that we would have a stronger marriage and a legacy for our children. Yeah, you know, our story is just very unique. Uh, and when you go back and look at all the chapters that have been written, God is a thread that we didn't see until later when the material ran out and the thread ran out and we saw how he had sewed it together and how important the faith in the church was in all of that. But just how we got here in this town and the relationship just kind of grew because it was very uh, in its infant stage, if you will, when when I moved here. And um, all the people that were brought into our lives it just wasn't, all right, we're going to be a faithful couple, and we're going to go to church. All those influences came about that made that a real reality because it was God's way, not our plan. I think that's been really our faith in church because of like-minded people in the church that are now very good friends. You have people you can talk to. I mean, not to the point you tell every detail of your situation, but you can understand things like forgiveness and understand the uh, communication importance and how you talk to each other, how you express your faith. Because, you know, life it, in general is very humbling. And if you don't have faith, how in the world do you go day to day with that, those humbling experiences? And we've had those, those things in our, in our time. Yeah, I mean, every not just marriage, but every life, you can expect some adversity and some significant adversity. And the way you respond to that adversity is much more telling about what's on the inside. But this adversity slash turbulence, you know, when you, you're, you're in love and all the good feelings about it and we're going to last forever and all this other stuff, and, and then some of those tough things happen, whether it's, based on stress at, at work or whether you begin to fundamentally disagree on something that is important to you both or um, there's some other intrusion into that um, that in love feeling and it causes you to maybe not feel so in love. In fact, maybe you don't like them anymore. And that happens a lot. <laughs> the, where I'm trying to mm-hmm. get to in, in this particular line of thinking is how have you maintained your marriage through, I know you have to have had adversity. I'm thinking about major adversity, things that have a track record of ending marriages. Has that happened for you? Sure it has. Um, Cal has already very kindly talked about his um, his expectations for marriage, and the partnership was was different than what I wanted. And and he talked about his selfishness, and I I appreciate that, and I really appreciate the fact that he realized that because that was a problem early 
early on in our marriage. Um, after our, we had both of our children, I worked full time. I made all of my clothes and Callan's clothes. I was working on my master's degree. I did all the cooking, all the house cleaning, and um, I did have some feelings, some strong feelings, and, and I think they've carried over through the years because I will often bring back to remember those times <laughs> when you just worked and you you went to the rec center and you did your thing and then you came home and it's just like I would say, could you just come home and help with supper and get the kids and then you go do your thing and then that frees me up to do what I need to do. He, I'm sorry, sweetheart. He would not even consider it mm. at, at, at that point. Now, I will say... There was one moment when I thought, I'm doing all of this by myself. What do I need him for? Um, and that was a very fleeting thought because I knew I needed him. And, um, you know, okay, I'll just, I'll just do what I, I have to do and um, be mad at him. But, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in this for the long haul. And, um, you know, we'll just see what happens, I guess, is what I was thinking. But I will tell you, with hindsight in all of this, the woman is the strongest partner in the marriage. I, I'm pretty, <laughs> I'm pretty sure about that. Um, that um, I think sometimes, particularly if you're our age and and you did come from um, a time when mom stayed home and and dads worked, and and truthfully, I always thought that's what I would do. I figured I would be like my mom, and I would. Stay at home and raise kids, and I, you know, didn't realize that I would even want to work, much less actually do it and um, in, enjoy it and feel fulfilled doing that. This is a lifestyle change that would have, yeah, that, 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 that you were unfamiliar with, yeah. yeah, and from your background and what you had seen, from my understanding of this, this is new to you. Um, this notion of what, and, and, and I don't know if it's just where you were at the time or what sort of the world was like at the time, but what I see in my own just observations in my own marriage and in other marriages, when that seed gets planted, whatever that, that irritant mm -hmm. is, it can either, if it is a weed that's going to take over the garden, if the weed doesn't get plucked out of the garden, it spreads yep. and it takes over the garden. And I'm not saying that people quit at the drop of a hat these days or in the last few decades when it doesn't uh, go well, when the feelings begin to change. It sounded like you, I mean, the, the, a little seed got lobbed in there and you said, no, 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 I'm in this for the long haul which is great, and, and, and that to me sounds like somebody who's saying, there's a seed that's getting planted inside of me. I can either feed it or I can remove it. Mm -hmm. And wisdom tells us, especially in hindsight, that removing it is the thing to do. It didn't get r removed. Um, it got fed more by Cal's continued behavior. So it took, it took a long time for that seed to go out. It's just I kind of buried it. Oh really? And, and yeah. But and, this and, notion of this isn't going to work. Yeah, I'm no. going to have to move on. That seed. Yeah. Yes. Now the behavior didn't change right, right. away. You had mm -hmm. to probably resolve right. that in whatever ways you guys resolve that. And you know, people say people don't change. I say bull to that. I, I agree with you on that. Well, you, I think people change, change if you want yeah. to change. You yeah. can change. Well, you know, I, I try to look at my own life, and when I feel like I've got behaviors inside of me or things that I'm doing that I, if I objectively look at it and don't look at it just purely from a selfish perspective, know that I need to improve and change. And I don't think I can do it. And I will go to God in prayer and I'll say, Hey God, I can't do it, man. I, I'm not the guy. The only person that can change me is you. And so I'm asking you to do that. And in my experience, that's how it's worked for me. And so when you've gotten into these conflicts, if mm -hmm. this is the main one, how did it get 
resolve? Did you, I just see people taking the seed of, you know what? This is never going to work. That's just who he is. And it's not going to work. And I'll stay with him when we've got mm-hmm. kids or whatever it is until the kids get, you know, and, but it just, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to bury it and I'm not going to until the time is right. You know, at that point, I knew I wasn't, he felt so strongly about it. I wasn't going to change his mind. So I, all I can do is change me. How, how, how can I work on me hmm. to deal with it? So I can, okay, so if I'm going to have to do all this myself, I just figure out a way to do it and, and you know, just work on I think it just made me stronger um, until he finally figured it out without me is, well I, is it my turn how did you yes. finally well that's a good question though because mm-hmm. how did you finally figure it out well let me just say this i can't speak for all men but as for me there are times i can be dumb as a rock i think you just spoke for all men and then, so that's that's fine i'm a driven person okay I've set goals, and I go after those goals with everything I have, and I hate to lose. Highly competitive, hate to lose. When I was younger, it was even worse. I grew up uh, with a single mom, basically after 14, who was a school teacher. When the father died, we had no insurance. So we were three of us, two sisters in college and myself in high school, living on very little. And I made a goal that... I'm going to work my tail off that that doesn't happen to my family. So I was driven, Mm -hmm. and I went to work at 6 o'clock in the morning, and I left at 6 o'clock at night. And my father had died of a heart attack, so I felt very strongly I needed to exercise to make sure Mm -hmm. with that, that stress of work that I was okay. So I put myself totally first and those goals totally first thinking I was doing the right thing for my family. Yeah, that's the effort was noble for others. It, it was actually with this motivation of I'm, I'm not going to put Vicky and my kids, our kids, into that situation. So the way that I protect them is by doing this. Right. Continue. So I thought I was doing the right thing. And it, I don't remember when, I don't remember what conversation finally got through my thick head. But when she told me the depth of what she was hurt, it hurt my heart. And I knew I had gone about this totally the wrong way. Now, how I changed that over time, I don't, I don't recall. Uh, but I'll, I'll regret it the rest of my life for, for any of that hurt or that pain that she had during that time. So the core of that, the core of that, in my opinion, is love one another. Absolutely. And forgiveness. She forgave me. Right. You but know, it hurts she, you now to yeah. think about oh, hurting absolutely. her. Oh, and no I don't doubt. know how many couples feel that remorse. Yeah. I feel like it gets ugly. And retribution and vengeance is because... It, creeps up into a lot of marriages and, and where there's this contempt for one another. It doesn't sound like you guys got into a place of, mm-hmm. of outright contempt no. for one another. Cause mm-hmm. when you get there, that's a, that's a hard bridge to cross back over, but something has to get in inside of you. It's Jesus. And that's what mm-hmm. we as believers mm-hmm. uh, know right. is the source of that. Right. And from time to time, I'll reflect on that time and, and I'll just tell her, I, I apologize again. I'll never forget it. And I tell him, forgive yourself. I've forgiven you. Forgive yourself and move on. Because it's not good for him to, if if that is festering, you know, that was a time in our life, move on. We're, we're, we've overcome that. You've talked about forgiveness a couple of times here. And you talked about the friends that you guys shared about forgiveness. You take, think about this situation and forgiveness. What is forgiveness? Do you want to answer that first? You want me to take a run? Go (laughs) right (laughs) ahead. Well, I think that um, you know, there's so much that Christ said about that, about forgiveness. Um, It's a healing 
if you will. And if you truly do love somebody or love something, or then forgiveness is a reaction to that. Uh, it's when you just are putting that person first and not yourself. Uh, and I, I'm, it warms my heart to know that she forgave me for that. If she hadn't, I don't know what I'd have done. Uh, and it, I think it takes, in order to have true forgiveness, it, it, the faith has got to be so great that you are Christ-like in your thoughts and in your heart that love is grander than any other option. Yeah, I, I don't think people are drawn to forgiveness. I think forgiveness is a hard thing for a lot of people, including married couples. I think forgiveness is a little bit of a churchy word and um, that people don't, I don't know if we all have a real understanding, a real grasp yeah. on what it is. I think that there are folks that um, will say they have forgiven and they haven't. And um, I've heard some good definitions. Um, I, I've talked about Andy Stanley before. He, he, in one of his sermons, he said, basically is, whatever the wrong that was done to you is, that you take whatever that wrong is, and you, maybe on paper, calculate what you are owed for it. If it's abuse as a child, you've had your childhood taken from you. You were owed a happy childhood, right? Or um, uh, a career. Let's say you didn't, weren't able to pursue the career that you wanted to because of what he had done or she had done. You know, you are owed the career you always wanted or whatever it else it is. And what he, he referred to, he's like, forgiveness is putting that on paper or whatever else it is and then saying, you no longer owe me these things. You no longer owe me these things. And I try to think of it, and that's a, it's still a hard thing because you still want something, even after it's done. Sometimes it creeps back up in conversations, and, and I don't know that forgiveness means that you got to completely forget it ever happened and not use it as a learning thing. But to truly forgive in your heart, I think, is a real challenging thing. I think it's one of the things that is a stumbling block for marriages that, that lead to divorce and inability to forgive. Do you think there's a thing that could happen between you that would be unforgivable and that you could, it wouldn't? To me, forgiveness is letting go. Just let letting it go. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, I, and also that means that you're not putting yourself first, that you are not so um, enmeshed in my feelings and, mm-hmm. and I was hurt for this and I deserve this. It's just kind of letting it go and realizing that you love this other person and he's, you want him to be happy too. Could anything, no, I don't think there's anything that could happen that, that would. Uh, I told him once, he, he may not remember this, but I told him once, I said, if you ever decide that you feel like you need to have an affair with somebody, you need to come and tell me first and let me do something about it before you act on it. Do you remember me telling you that? Yes. He does not. It must have been a sure book or something have. I had read yeah, or, I, I or, or something. What if he did that? I mean, what would you really? Yeah, I, I would say. What, what would is you it? do if he said that? I would I, say, let's talk about it. What makes you think that you need to do that? You know, what is it about this other person or about me? What is it that makes you feel that you need to do that? And if he could say our sex life is really bad, then I could either I would have a choice then. I can fix it or I can say, go, go. But I think this may not sound right, but I think he would owe me that. We made a commitment. If you think that you really are toying with this idea, then you owe me to talk about it and let's, let's get it out on the table. Do you have a relationship out. such that, and I'm, this is a crazy question, that you feel like he would maybe consider actually talking to you about a thing like that? Yes, I do. But I also think that he would never consider it. Oh, yeah. I don't think he would ever put himself in a position where he would have those feelings. And knowing Cal, I agree with yeah. you 100%. Yeah, I'm, I'm very fortunate in that 
but that's not the case for a lot yeah. of people. Right. And you, Cal, early on mentioned this whole notion of communication. Right. And it's a word that also gets used a lot in, in marriage, especially. And I don't know that people understand what that is. I know people that feel like they can't talk to their spouse. Mm-hmm. That's a sad thing. Well, we, uh, How do you just, fix that? I, I don't know. We've just practiced this belief all of our marriage to to talk and tell each other what we think. And we all, haven't always been good at it. And, and I, I, but it takes practice. It, it does take it, it takes practice and maturity, and sometimes it takes the reflection of somebody else, That's like true. like our daughter, who will say, "Mom, what you said to Dad wasn't very kind," and "Mom, you shouldn't say," and then she. She was a college student at the time, and she gave me this book called Critical um, Conversations that she was, you know, in, in her one of her communications classes. Uh, so, and, and I do think it's an awareness. It's an awareness that, oh, well, I said something. I didn't mean it to sound like that or to come across like that. But it does because I don't realize in the heat of the moment how I sound or how it comes out or, you know, the, the, ter- the terminology of, you, well, you always do this. Well, no, you don't always do this, but, you know, that comes out. That's how we, how we talk. So I think it, it has taken us a while to mm-hmm. figure that out and to not let what the other person says in the heat of the moment to realize it is coming in the heat of the moment. And they probably don't really mean that exactly there's a difference between communicating and fighting right to me at least anyway yeah, sure. and we try to communicate when we're fighting but really what we're doing is that we're fighting yeah i think mm-hmm. and there's some communication that may take place there but i feel like you got to learn both of those there's people that know how to fight and there's people that do not know how to fight right and you got to fight fair you're going to fight but let's but you got to train yourself fair. to do that yeah. you got to you got to sure. consciously go in to that and not blast holes in the other one. Mm-hmm. And, and there's generally a deeper reason yeah. for a reaction than just reacting to something that's said. In other words, there may be something else going on in her life that's got her concerned or reacting the way she's reacting. And that's, you got to get past the, the little fight to get to the real reason for the concern. How did you learn that? Did you learn that over time? Or did somebody, did you? you, Observation. Yeah. Did you have a pastor say, hey, here's the thing, or you read some Mm -hmm. books? Go ahead. You said observation. Well, Uh, yeah. Probably a combination of all that. Because I I do read read a lot. And so, yeah. Um, But, I mean, just recently, he will say to me, all right, something's going on. And because you are really snappy or you are, you know, I can, I can tell and, and, and it'll be like, there is something <laughs> there is. And then I realize, yeah, actually there is, there's something in the back of my mind, you know, whether it's work related or whatever that is preoccupying me so that I am a little bit more on edge. So it is kind of an over time, yeah. really watching each other and, and knowing. Did you ever set like ground rules for fighting? Together, did you say, "Hey, look, we're going to get mad at each other. We can't do this." I don't think we ever set those rules, but I think again through the influences in your life, what you read, uh, what you see from friends, what you learn through faith, then you know, those ground rules or boundaries. Just did you ever fight? Did you ever fight bad? Did you did you ever have a time where you like we we've crossed some lines with our fighting here? Because I guess what I'm getting to is if there are people that don't fight well. I would say you could probably count on one hand the times that it just was ugly. Mm-hmm. You know, either curse here or things like that. Or, but I don't think we've ever attacked each other. At least I don't remember being attacked. I would remember that, I guess. Yeah, I'm surprised that you're not bringing up one of our... Um, well, I'm old. You know, For, I forget one things. Of, one of the fights when we moved into our, our first house, and I needed some help hanging oh, no. hanging some things on oh, the yeah. wall, and yeah, he something. wasn't. He just wasn't going to help me, and and I, you know, I don't know what how what happened, but I I got so mad I threw the hammer down. It bounced over and hit his foot, and um, <laughs> so 
So I'm just glad she wasn't a good aim, or it probably hit me in the head. <laughs> so that you know, that's the worst I can think of. Thing I do remember, um, there were some arguments where he would just flat out tell me I was wrong. That, and that wasn't real wise. No, it? it wasn't. And and you know, the thing was, I, it wasn't that I wanted to be right. I wanted to be heard. Yeah. I just wanted him to accept that I had an opinion that was different from his, and that's okay. So it took a, it took us a while, and then we got to where we could. I, I think after after that argument, then to come back later and say, "All right, I don't have to be right. I just have to be recognized that I have an opinion." I go back to the dumb as a rock theory. You know, and it just took me a few more times to understand what she was trying to say. In marriage, um, in the vows, it talks about the two shall become one flesh. That's in Scripture a few times. When did you feel like that happened for you? Was it on your wedding day, or was it 10 years down the line? Or when did you feel like, you know what, we are one? Yeah. What do you, I've got uh, I've got a story, but okay. I I think I always felt that from the from from yeah because I just thought I mean we're we're a couple we're gonna we're doing this together and 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 that's uh, he's the one I chose so that's but I think it's the birth of a child too when all of a sudden you have produced this little creature that you're gonna have to take care of and it's it's you know a combined effort. So I guess I've always kind of felt that way. What is your story? <laughs> well, we go back to that adversity question. About midway through our marriage, year 2000, Vicki was diagnosed with breast cancer. And that was a eye-opener for me. And if we're truly one, how do I react to this? How do I support her? What do we do? Just to make the long story a little shorter, after going through a mastectomy, we were in the hospital the, the night of that operation. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, I heard Vicki crying. So I got up. We were fortunate enough to be able to, I was fortunate enough to stay with her in, in the hospital that night. And got up and went over to her and said, are you Okay. She made the comment of, um, how can you love me like this? After all these years, I still get emotional about it. Because without even thinking, I said I love you more than I ever have. And, and that's when you know you're one. When, when you're in that battle together, and the only way through it is to do it together. And um, uh, since that day, and I'll never forget that moment ever, I, I still look at her and feel that emotion about her that I felt that moment. And I, if that's not being one, I, I don't know what is. Do you feel like that was a, a defining moment or maybe a, a kind of a culmination of where you had gotten to, to that point yeah. and you were just now aware yeah. As you look back on it, and again, our story so involves faith in, in God and in Christ and all those things. Not, not that we scream it from the rafters or, or anything like that, but we, we just know in our hearts how important that is. And that we owe everything that we have and who we are to that faith. And this was just another step in that journey that strengthened that faith. And I, th I do think that that did strengthen our marriage. We, it was already strong. I think that's why we could, we could get through all of that. And, and I will say, because here I've, I've made comments about the negative things that Cal's done. Through that whole ordeal, which was about a, a year long from the time that we found out I, I had cancer and all the mastectomy and the reconstruction and all, all that kind of stuff, um, he was my rock throughout the whole thing, and he never once made a false move. He never said the wrong thing. He never did the wrong thing. He was there with me 
completely. Um, and he allowed me then to be able to focus on myself and what I needed to, to be able to, to survive that and, um, mentally and, and physically. Um, and I'm so thankful. I was so thankful that he, you know, for what he did, which he, he would probably tell you he didn't think he did too much, um, except just be there for me. But yeah, I think it, it cemented us in, in a way that wouldn't have. And we were, I mean, I was 45. That's pretty young to have to go through a cancer experience. And well, if you, if you go back in time and you're listening to what Vicki has said, the lessons learned of me not listening, not hearing her was a concern. Well, I heard her. I heard her at that moment. It finally clicked over time what it means to hear. And you don't have to hear it verbally, but you can see it and you can feel it. And it was it was not a sacrifice. It was it was just something that you did out of love. So you, we we really experienced that Christ-like love during those years. And she became my hero during that time. The way she faced that adversity, she was never negative. Now, she had some moments that she cried and those type things, which I understand that. But to go through reconstruction, the way she went through it, and telling the doctor when he went through the process of what he was going to do and telling him the first thing you're going to do is pray before you operate. And I just grin from ear to ear. <laughs> yeah, you talk about <clears throat> the Christ-like love that was in that whole thing, that whole year plus, especially in the hospital. People, I think, confuse the word "love" is a is a is an often it, it's got a lot of different meanings. I think, <laughs> and um, it's rarely referred to as the Christ-like love that you mentioned. It seems like you were, over time, getting to the place of Christ-like love. And, and for me, as I have, I, I think if I had to boil my own faith journey and search down, it is this quest to understand this word love and what it's not. I think a lot of people feel like um, it is based in, in uh, feelings, feelings and when feelings change that means it's time for a change um versus this sense of unselfishness of willing in your soul in your core the good of someone else without any selfish returns right it's a selfless i want great things for you and it would cause a guy to never bat an eye to be at his wife's side during this thing in any way she needs, right? It doesn't sound like you were saying, well, you know, the guys are getting together to play golf uh, on Saturday. I wonder if we'll be out of here in time for me to go do that with those guys or or whatever else. You know what I'm saying? It it, it sounds to me, and I'm watching your expressions when you talk, and, and I'm hearing what's inside of you and it sounds like it was there's no other place that I I could even be and there's no other way I feel other than I just want great for her and it right. doesn't matter what we do mm -hmm. I owe her everything she owes me nothing it's that feeling that to me is Christ-like love and that's what I think is missing most in marriage today and Potentially is the result, you know, I'm sure a marriage expert can say, well, you're an idiot, you don't know anything. Which and, and that would be true. But it's, I, I feel like it's when we get to this place where we are not so focused on our own needs, but we're almost exclusively focused on their needs, that it's hard to go down this path of divorce. Harder. It's the Christ-like love. It's, mm -hmm. That's two becoming one. Sounds like that's that's a great um, manifestation of that in that particular moment where 
now you probably can't imagine not being together unless death parted you or whatever. But it's getting to that, right? Mm-hmm. It's getting to from from in love, and it's going to have a magical journey in our whole lives. It's going to be great. No, we never going to this place of actual Christ-like love. And I know it's a journey for everybody. I know that it's almost no people probably enter the marriage with that because we're all focused on our own needs. Right. Mm-hmm. I want to know how you transition from I want my needs met by this marriage to the Christ-like love that you're talking about now. I think what I've learned over these years is that, you know, we all have basic needs in life, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. And if you put the other's needs and wants first before your own, then that usually results in Christ-like love. Uh, And all those are equally important, uh, no doubt about that. Uh, I think from a man's standpoint, the physical part uh, can be challenging. But when your wife tells you, you know, you got to get out of jail free card here, but you got to talk to me about it, that's pretty smart on her part. I think a lot of couples have a difficulty talking about the physical part. The emotional part is more, to me, like a personality. I'm very emotional. Emotional guy, I express my faith emotionally, express everything emotionally. Sometimes not well uh, or not good. Uh, Vicky is very um, introspective with that, uh, doesn't show that side very often. From a, again, a spiritual part, we express that very differently as well. And it, I can't. Ex- uh, Help but go back and, and talk about the communication, just being able to. If you indeed put them first in those needs and can talk through those items and come to the part where you are not selfish with those, then you experience something that is way beyond joy. It's also a choice. It is a, it is a, a choice that you make that... Um, that I am going to do that, that I'm going to try to be less selfish and into myself. And if we're having trouble communicating, how can I learn how to to do that better? Um, Or it's a choice to um, focus on, to remember those vowels. And then I'm, I'm going to put that first and I'm going to figure out how to, how to do that. And I'm not going to dwell on all the little things he does. It drives me crazy. I'm not, I'm not going to. I'm just going to let that go and just focus on the. on the. Is there a long list? Of, no. Okay. I, I'm I, sure there is for my wife. I, 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 <laughs> have, I, I no longer think it. You know, I yes, every once in a while I'll think, why didn't then I go, you know what? I can pick that up. It's not a big deal. Just move on. It's, you know, but those, those are the, that's exactly the kind of stuff that adds up. If you allow it to add up, that's right. You can choose how you view anyone. Mm -hmm. And I think you have a really good point there, Vicki, in that a lot of it is a decision. You can choose how you view anyone and you can, it's like I had a person that pulled out in front of me the other day. And, go, and, and like, like went really slow. <laughs> and I made a few remarks in the car um, to myself. I was in there alone, and um, maybe, maybe even commented on their character a little bit. And um, to me, I had chosen to view them as uh, an obstacle and um, something that interfered with where I was going, and projected some pretty negativity, uh, some pretty negative thoughts onto the person. Well, we get to a place where it's a four lane. And so I go around him or whatever. I look over, and I know this person. <laughs> I know him well. And it's somebody I highly respect and just love the heck out of. And I said, you know what? You just got through calling that person? Mm-hmm. 
and I know who they are, but it, and, and it struck me, and, and yeah, I shook my head. It's like, well, there you go again. You know, you're never going to learn how to, how to do this. But uh, I know that my wife can choose to see me as somebody who is um, very opinionated, um, uh, loud, or or over talkative, or um, maybe um, projects my own thoughts onto others and that sort of thing. Um, and I, but I, I think she also could choose to see me as a very gentle and generous person. And, and I can tell when she's seeing me as one of those two things. And I see her the same way. And I say the same with friends. I think we have to choose the mm. positive way to view them. That's right. We can't stamp mm. them. We cannot label people as, as their worst. And I think a lot of couples, when we get into this place of contempt, everything they do is disorganized. They're the most disorganized person I've ever seen. Look at those socks down there. And, you know, I can't believe their side of the bathroom looks this way. And, 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 and even like small things, like there might be a, a shoe that's not put in the right place. Oh, gosh, they're so disorganized. And, and that adds up to us to turn this view into a, a, a terrible person that I don't know. Why, why am I married to this person? Mm-hmm. How do you get, I mean, is it just like, do you snap yourself out of it and say, wait, wait, wait. Let's just decide. Or is there some other trick to do? Is it looking at yourself and seeing your own faults? Because I don't know how often we do that. First, let me apologize for pulling out in front of you. you (laughs) (laughs) Um, Choice is, is an incredible word. It means so much other than just off the surface. It's very deep. I could not imagine someone else living with me and my what I do and choices I make that I don't even think about there were a couple of things about Vicki early on that really attracted me other than her beauty one was the standards that she believed in and the principles that she followed and she has very high standards and expectations you can ask her children that there's nothing wrong with that Sometimes it's very difficult to live up to those. But it's gotten to a point in our lives that I will think and make a choice a lot of times based on how I know she will react. Putting things back in their place. Putting the seat down on the commode. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, you if you, if you really love this person you're going to choose to try your best to meet those standards and expectations even if it especially if it means changing the way you would normally have sure, done it sure sure i think i forget who it is that told me the story about nancy and ronald reagan you know he was a out on the ranch roping cattle or whatever and she was a much more of a society type and much more prim and proper and um you know i think somebody asked her talking about how she loved to be at the ranch and that sort of thing. She's like, I don't love the ranch because I love the ranch. I love the ranch because Ronnie loves the ranch. And so she would just adjust who she was because she loved him and she en- enjoyed him enjoying things so much. that was, He was in his element. It wasn't her element, but it was her element because it was his element. Mm-hmm. And that's not a, well, I guess it is a submissive thing, but not a male-female thing. If, if we both do that, it seems like as a married couple, if we both do that, you've gotten into a, it seems like a, a, a really good place. So, um, have you ever found yourself in times where you weren't, where you loved them, weren't going to necessarily get a divorce or anything like that, but you didn't have this in love feeling? I, I can't, I, I can't recall I can't think that. Of, no. now, you've it, always been in love, it, even it, after the worst fights and. Yeah, it's a, it's yeah. a ebb and flow as, as you were saying about about the the feeling sometimes you do feel more passionate and um connected um but it's an ebb and flow and it goes along with life but no i've always never yeah i've always loved loved you always yeah. i've never not you know i think one thing we've practiced fairly well along the way going back to your comments stacy what what causes that to fall out 
we've never publicly attacked each other. That was always a kind of a no-no. You don't put your spouse down in front of other people. You don't say, look at that lady over there. She is really fine. You don't do that to your wife. Um, uh, we've, we've, I'm sure there's been occasions that I have said the wrong thing, uh, but I don't recall. No, there have been there have been a couple I've said the wrong thing. You've told me later, but uh, well, it probably hurt yeah. my feelings, which yeah. pretty easy to do. But um, we've been I think we've been fortunate along that line. It, and and that that you're speaking really of respect, yeah. mm-hmm. of respect. Yeah. I was for thinking e- that same word for each other and yeah. um, and the marriage and 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 I think that that goes along with it as well is that you have to have a respect for each other and um because if I didn't have respect for you that you were a fine wonderful person and that might change my feelings but you've already said how about my high standards I would never have married someone who didn't have yeah. have those feelings either I mean those standards did you have that same respect when you would continue to come home early on in the marriage and not you, you know yes because I think that's part of why I tolerated it so much because I knew why he, I, I knew, I knew because of his father's early death and his feelings of, of fear of that might happen to him. I knew why he wanted to go work out seven days a week and all that. I understood that. And I saw his point. And, uh, so yeah, there was, there was enough respect there that, yeah, I, I understand it. And so let's just, we'll just, so I think that did play into it. Do you think respect is a thing that is earned and maintained or is freely given by decision? It's earned. So had he done something to not earn your respect, Mm -hmm. would that have been it? Would you have chosen to give him your respect anyway? Um, I might have uh, given him um, the option to build that respect back, which would be the same thing as saying, if you, if you think you're going to have an affair, come to me first and let's figure out why. Uh, if he'd had an affair, um, that would have been, that would have been different, but it might not have been a game changer. Yeah. And hypotheticals are tough, but, you know, if you've been married for 45 years and you've just had this high respect and, and for each other, and it's because Vicky's earned it for 45 years or Cal's mm-hmm. earned it for 45 years, there's a lot of people that have, have earned a lack of respect, quite frankly, right. sure. for things Absolutely. that they've done. Right. Absolutely. And, and those are reasons, reasons right. for right. divorce. Mm-hmm. And um, it seems to me, that we should consider, like you said, maybe, uh, maybe I ha- maybe I don't flip that switch off and just quit because they lost my respect, but that this notion of till death do us part causes us to say, wait a minute, I'm not going to quit. And and usually there there's an underlying reason for the the loss of respect for whatever the person has done, uh, particularly if it comes out of the blue out out of you know 40 years then uh then maybe there's a reason behind that and it's worth it if you really love that person to figure out why what happened and uh what caused you to jump off the deep end or or yeah i I, I think about um, you guys and if if one of your keys to success is that you guys have maintained respect for one another for 45 years that may be something that's that those bridges have been burned in much younger marriages of people that might be listening is like, well, I've just lost respect for my spouse already. So does that mean, what does that mean for me? How would you, uh, you just maybe haven't had that situation, which is wonderful. Right. Uh, and I think about my parents, my parents had been married, uh, 20, over 25 years when they divorced came out of the, the blue. Cause I was married. Justin was about a year old. That was a really interesting uh, time of life. Now, my father was an alcoholic, very function, high functioning. He was president of a bank, and he was very high functioning, very 
prominent member of the community, and he had an affair. All of this was news to me. News to me back, you know, it was interesting. Um, you know, my father made mistakes, um, and there were probably people who who um, who lost respect for him, but. And actually, my dad did so many good things for people as 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 a banker that even when I would go home and they knew, you know, about dad's uh, situation, that they were all they would always ask about him and they were always kind about it. And um, and then they would always tell me, you know, there were two banks in town and I went to the old bank and they wouldn't give me time of day. And your dad would be was the only one who would give me a loan when I needed it. And um so I, I do think there's that possibility for forgiveness because, you know, alcoholism is an illness. And even my mom ended up, you know, forgiving him, and they remained friends um, in, until their death. Um, I, I'm, I'm processing all this as I'm saying it, so I'm not really. Um, That's fine. No, I don't know that I've really thought too much about their divorce. Well, the, the, the alcoholism uh, brings a whole nother dynamic in the marriage situation, uh, just like the cancer and so forth. And in this situation, as, as I reflect back on it and think through that, the only way to really help your dad was for him to lose everything. So he could admit he had a problem, and get help. And um, which is that's what happened. basically what happened. Yeah, it, 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 that's a that's a tough thing to to process because we talk about you know forgiveness and respect and maintaining the love of Christ yeah. through um, yeah. the hardest of times, and it's easier said you know around a table like this than living it and, and done. Yeah. And I would ask a que- the question of anyone, how, how do you, how do you maintain the love of Christ and a marriage through even those things? I mean, it, if you have the love of Christ, just as Christ would have done for an alcoholic or someone who's, who's, um, struggling with whatever you do forgive them. I mean, that's the one thing that God tells us we we love everyone and and we should forgive everyone. So I, I think that you just choose to do that, whether your marriage can survive or not. Um, because I, I can think of situations where um, a married couple w- would be facing something like that, and the partner, want, whoever had the, the, the issue, couldn't get a hold of it and would choose to, or would go down, as my father did, the, where he, he just lost everything. Um, you could still, my mom could still divorce him knowing that um, she couldn't live like that. That he, he was not going to give up the alcohol and she could not live, live with that. That she could divorce him and um, still love him though and still want to help him. As, as, as my mother did, and she reached out to all the alcoholic groups that she could to say, what do I do to help him? And they would say, nothing. Nothing. You don't let him back in the house. If he comes to you, throw him a blanket outside, but there is nothing you can do to help him until he decides he wants help. So, so I, I can see how you, you could do that. You could still have that, that love, of a, that Christ-like love, although... It's a small town, and everybody knows what's going on, and my mom is, you know, everybody's feeling, oh, you know, poor Laverne. Look what's happening to her. And and she called me and said, I'm loading up everything. I'm moving to Tuscaloosa with you all. I can't do, handle this anymore. And, um, and then she called back the next day, and she goes, I'm not coming. I'm not letting him control my life. I'm not the one who made – who's – made the mistake. I, I'm not leaving my friends in my town. I'm, I'm staying here. I'm, I'm dealing with it. So uh, I do think 
if you have the love of Christ, that Christ-like love, you can get through whatever you need to in, in whatever form it takes. But 20, 26 years ago on my 40th birthday, my mother-in-law said, happy birthday, I'm moving to Tuscaloosa to live with you. Mm-hmm. And what was one of the greatest gifts we could be given? You, you think about this now. A mother-in-law moves in to the house with the family. That's a dynamic that could lead to a lot of problems unless everybody was on the same page of how this is going to work. And she cooked, gave, gave Vicki the cook <laughs> that she deserved with all the other things she had going on. She helped raise our children in the same fashion and manner that we were raising them. So that was that influence. Um, we both have been very big on family and the importance of family. Uh, it was, again, one of those God gifts that we got. That if you if you look at it in the wrong way, selfishly, well, she's going to get in my way. She's going to interrupt all these things in our life. Uh, how do we have intimacy? Uh, all of those things. And, you know, we just worked it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, she, she brought more to the table. Oh, than, yeah. Than... Yeah. Yeah, God uses mm-hmm. difficult situations or, or things that may even be outside of his will, um, I believe, to... For good, right? All oh, things yeah. work together for yeah. good for those who love Him. So, um, so that's good. So, what does your spiritual life? I mean, we all have our own ways of connecting with God individually and that personal one-on-one relationship with God, whatever that looks like. But as a couple together, what does your married spiritual life look like? We do not study the Bible together, and we do not regularly pray together. Um, and Cal's already mentioned that you know he's more emotional in his spirituality, and I'm very reserved and private, and I don't even like to pray out loud in front of people. That's that's just I'm I'm very uncomfortable with that, uh, and somewhat with Cal because he is such a beautiful prayer. I just don't feel. Uh, but we do pray during tough times, and we do pray, uh, like when we travel, a lot of the times I'll, I'll say, all right, Cal, say our little travel put prayer. Uh, we prayed today coming over here, and I, actually I, I, I did pray she did. about that because I wanted to be sure that we were saying the right saying things. what God intended mm-hmm. for, you know, the message would be what, what God intends. Um, so we don't do that a lot. We... Um, but we both have our own spiritual lives, and uh, you know, I, I do lots of reading and spiritually, and um, of course, my big thing is music. You know, singing in the choir and and singing those beautiful classical pieces. Um, that's fulfills me in, in major ways. I wonder how that is in how it's because I think most people are that way. I know people that are very faith filled people that that is a personal thing between them and God. I I think that's Mm -hmm. how Allison is. Mm -hmm. Allison is not comfortable praying openly. She does it sometimes, but I wouldn't say that her faith is weak because of that, right? She, right. It's still mm-hmm. good, and and we believe that God is still the center of our lives, mm-hmm. whether we do those things or not. It's just interesting to see what that looks like for couples. I think, um, I think it's probably different for everybody. There may be uh, families that have grown used to that, um, and maybe that's it. Maybe it's just habit formation and how it's evolved over time. It's kind of for us. I mean, anything else about your spirituality as a couple? Well, I think that, um, you know, God makes us all different. And as the uh, proverb says, we're all fearfully and wonderfully made. So there's a personality ingredient in our faith and how we express it. Um, In reaction to the adversity of the cancer 
I decided to become a lay pastor, also to become a Stevens minister. That was my reaction to thanking God for His presence in all of that. And I needed a deeper relationship with Him through that. So this was a method of finding that. Early on in our membership of, at First Press, uh, I became a Sunday school teacher. How I got to that point was <laughs> very selfish on my part, but I knew that if I didn't place myself in a glass fishbowl where people could see me, I would have a tougher time being the faithful person I thought I needed to be. And having taught senior high Sunday school for four decades, I've maintained that, knowing that if I was seen by any of those kids in a negative manner, it would break my heart. But that's what I needed. You know, Vicky's is fulfilled through music, and she has a beautiful voice. Uh, the first time I ever saw her was uh, her displaying that voice in a talent show. Uh, and so she's giving, she's worshiping, she's praising God through her, the gift that she's been given. I hope that. Yeah, makes you, sense. so you guys are kind of doing a, a parallel thing here <laughs> together. Right. And I don't think there's a template that's carved out for everybody that says, here's the way um, spiritual life works as a married couple. I think right. it's. Well, the first thing, you, you don't tell them how to live their spiritual life, you nah. don't tell them how to express it. You support what they do. You know, and she, she does one of the greatest things for me, and she doesn't realize it. If I'm tracking down a path of doing something that I don't need to do or say, she'll say, don't go there. That's not you. That's not who God made you to be. And that redirects me. Now, when I say all this, there's going to be a lot of people that, that may hear this that go, I, you know, that's not him. He's not done that. Well, look, I'm going to tell you right now, if it wasn't for Vicki and her listening skills, when I get in a situation where life gets crazy and I'm trying to make choices, I'll go to her and express all the stress, express all the options, express you know, my fears, and that's a big word, fear, and admit it. And she listens to it and helps me deal with it so I know how to react. And, and that's a gift. I would think that you both take comfort in knowing where the other person's heart is and that they each have their own strength of faith in the way that it is so that when you go to the other one with things that are on your mind or that are important to get their perspective, knowing that it's got its roots in faith has to be a pretty comforting thing. And that's, to me, it sounds like how you share your spirituality. And, um, I think that's important. I think people will be able to relate to that and, and maybe not feel as self-conscious about maybe our way of doing things at home is broken because we don't pray together all the time or, you know, do Bible study together. I think there's couples that do that and it works well for mm -hmm. them and they, they need that. It sounds like yours is just a different deal. And um, what you're talking about with these things that go on in life, when you feel, um, you know, I had a, someone on uh, a few weeks ago that talked about the importance of listening to your spouse and God gives you your spouse for balance and, um, when you get into, especially when you get into situations where you're overweight on one side, you know, and yeah. the spouse mm -hmm. can, especially the root in faith can give you the balance you need to make a, get some clarity around mm -hmm. what really is Absolutely. God's way of, um, working in your life. So, so you guys have been married for 45 years. We've been married for 12 and, you know, even us, when we go to a wedding and see a, a new young couple getting married, you're, you're happy and excited for them and that sort of thing. But you also have something inside of you. It's like, man, they don't know what they're getting to, <laughs> you know, and they don't. Right. And that's part of it. It's like having a baby. You don't know how to do this thing. You just have to take it home and hope it works out. <laughs> and God gives you the way that it's going to your own path. <clears throat> but what do you think? What is your when, when you go to a, a wedding with a 
a new young couple or just a new couple in general, um, what are your thoughts when you go see somebody getting married? Number one, um, I pray for them. And I, I don't mean that in a way that they've got troubles in their path. I pray that they can have over time what we have. Not that, that ours is anything better than anybody else's, but it's you learn along the way. And the expectations day one are very different than the expectations day 45 years. Mm-hmm. And, and life drives that. I wouldn't take anything away from the na- uh, being naive uh, about that. I wouldn't take anything about the excitement of loving each other in all the ways that you can. Uh, and, I, and I pray that they have all of that. But above all, that they put a priority on faith. Because without it, it can be a very difficult journey. Faith makes you a stronger, better person. And then that just makes your marriage stronger and better. Yeah, don't you feel like it <clears throat> can um, give you a thing in common? Mm-hmm that there's a greater thing between you. I think that's kind of one of the things that God tries to communicate to us in a marriage, Mm -hmm. that if you guys will both look at me, Mm -hmm. I I got this, just like you, right? Just like Peter on the, walking on the water. Mm -hmm. If you'll just keep your eye on me, you're going to, I got the path here. And I, I don't know how you, get to that place if you didn't start there. I think it's it happens for a lot of people because they start having thinking about having kids or or we we're now a couple and we're married and so we want to do married things. We should find a church is one of the things and we should do that and and you do but that's different than igniting your faith and making that um a priority in your life. And that's just a decision, right? I mean that's right. the Holy Spirit moving you to and God pursuing you to look for him Mm -hmm. and to pay attention to him. But Mm -hmm. I don't know if there's a formula or or some way that (laughs) I know there's not a formula, but would you recommend, all right, Hey, here's how you get to faith. If you don't have it when you're starting out, there's gotta be a conversation where you listen to each other to determine how to get to faith and what faith is, because it can be very different for each person just like we talked about personality and expression of faith, particularly spirituality. Life presents, I don't care who you are, life is going to present trials and tribulations that you're going to have the option to choose faith or not. And when you don't, it could be a very dreadful path. I mean, I know what you can speak to are the things that have caused your marriage to thrive. What would you say? I mean, I think you've hit a few of them in the conversation, but what do you? Th- what would you say are your strategies for peace in a thriving marriage? Because that's what I sort of see in you guys. That's, you talked about Cal. Cal, you mentioned something beyond joy earlier. Yeah. To me, that word is peace. I always come back to that word. There's this. Peace. There's a big difference, in my opinion, between happiness and joy. You only find joy through peace and through faith. Happiness has nothing to do with that. Joy needs to be the goal in life. And what is it going to take to get there? Well, if you're self-centered, you're not going to find it. If you're godless in your beliefs, you're not going to find it. Because only through Him will you find it. Putting the other person first in all their needs helps present that joy. And when you do that, it goes back to the greatest commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. And love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And if you do that, all these things come natural in putting the other person first. Now, are we perfect at it? No. No, but you know what? The biggest thing I look forward to every day is going home. 
And it's always been that way. I have never, ever not wanted to go home. And Vicki makes the house the home. It's a home. It's not a house. And it's a home because she's there. It's a home because our family is represented there. It's a home because there's peace there. It's a home because we find joy together. And, you know, you go back and look over the 45 years, and I, I see it more today than I did 45 years ago. And I think that's God's way of showing us, is that He has just weaved a path in that 45 years of His presence through everything and every part of our journey. And, and you know, now that we're 65 and 66, we probably have a tendency to look back more than we look forward, to reflect on life because of the unknown and, and what could be a, a shorter period of time. So, you know, the, the hugs are a little longer. Uh, the patience is way longer. The love is beyond measure. That was beautifully said. It wasn't was it? beautifully said. So the only thing I would add is <clears throat> here again, my thing about it being a choice. I can I can choose to let the little things bother me and be miserable, or I can he and he doesn't do this as an example. Or I can pick up the dirty socks and be glad that he's still in my life and that I, I get to do that. And and I and I choose to have joy. I choose to be happy with my life the way it is. You know, so I haven't traveled the world all I'd like to, or, you know, there are a lot of things that I always thought, you know, I always wanted to own a grand piano and all this kind of stuff. You know, um, you know what? I'm so happy with my life and the, and the little things mean so much. And so it is when Cal comes home and, and, um, and I get a hug or, you know, he makes lattes for me in the morning. It's just little things that just make life with him wonderful and I do think we as as he said we're in our 60s now so as we start looking towards aging together that's a whole no <laughs> that's a whole nother podcast because you know it is it is now learning to grow old gracefully together and not get caught into this oh my gosh I've got too many aches and pains and and as I look in the mirror and I can see, I look like an old grandmother now. And um, you, you Well, know, nothing just... <laughs> can be further from the truth. You're a long way from that, I'll tell you. It's, but it's, the, it's... The, 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 you've mentioned it a couple of times, Vicki, is this, um, this disciplined mindset of this is our marriage and it'll be successful. And so I'm going to choose the positive. I'm going to choose gratitude over selfishness. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know that people understand that it's a choice versus just falling in line behind whatever emotion pulls us that particular day or moment. But that we recognize the stress of the day or lack of sleep or the situation that happened at the grocery store with the checkout person or whatever else could cause my emotions to go one way, but I still choose to see my spouse this way. Mm -hmm. And that sounds to me like it's played a role in your feelings in your marriage from the get-go. And I wonder how much of that is my personality. That, I you agree. Know, that, that, I, that I just yeah. happen to be like that. Sure. The personality part of it is so important. And, and I, would, I would certainly suggest that anybody listening to this do a, a personality inventory and share that. If you've never done it before, share it with your spouse. You both take it and, and learn new things about each other. It's it's quite an experience. Um, I remember the first time we took ours. What did you take? What which one? This was the Millers, not not uh, Millers. Uh, Myers, Myers Briggs. Briggs. Myers Briggs. Myers Briggs, and they they had a motto. As a result of our personality, mine was 
let's get it done. <laughs> yeah. Vicky's was, let's get it done right. <laughs> That's a very that different right? concept. <laughs> you know, but the thing is, it's like Vicky said a minute ago about the socks. Now, 20 years ago, I would have said, I didn't put those socks on the ground. Hearing her say that, I'm thinking, now, have I put the socks? Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to listen over those years and, and not leave my socks out. Listening to improve versus listening to respond. Well, listening mm-hmm. to please uh. so that she doesn't get agitated. Listening to please. Yeah. What a concept. Putting her first. She knows is how important. picky I am. But, you know, she can leave five pairs of shoes out. I don't say anything because it doesn't bother me. But if I leave five pairs of shoes out and she leaves five pairs of shoes out, she won't say anything. But if I'm the only one that leaves five <laughs> pairs of shoes out, you know, could you put your shoes up? Every yeah. one of it's us has that. this. It's, that I is know, great. We, we do. And, and, and like, he'll, he'll try really hard to put the dishes in the dishwasher. And I'm really picky about that. And uh, so he'll say, why? Why do I even, you're just going to come along and redo it. And my thought is, okay, so if it bothers you, leave them. Leave them in the sink because I'm not asking you to put them in the dishwasher. I, you know I'm picky. I'm picky. I'm not asking you to do that. But if you choose to do that, just know it can't bother you when I come back and fix it the way I want. You just have to let it go. That only took me 10 years to catch on to that. <laughs> I don't put things in the I, dishwasher anymore. I, I am very picky. I like things. High standards. The way they, and, and I do nothing if it hasn't been thought out and there's a reason for everything I do. I, I don't do anything without it being a logical reason. So that's and very I, hard to the, live with. Yeah, these I'm are very, the, the very, dynamics yes, of marriage yes. that make it so unique to everybody. Right. And I'm, I'm guarantee you, everybody that's listening to this right now is like, I am just like Vicky sure. or I am just like Cal. Right. Why? And it's yep. just, it's funny to me, mm-hmm. the differences in personalities, yep. but what I appreciate is each of your willingness to understand the other one and their personalities. I'm just going to pick up the sock or right. I'm just going to try to do it the way she wants right. it. Cause she like, it's, it's the willingness to have compassion and give respect to the other one. I think before they've earned it. Yes. And, well, and that's, that's true. Yeah, because they don't have to earn it. And and and, and I think when you do that, mm-hmm. it's it, it, the respect will 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 also be earned right. down the line. Right. right. But it's your choice. It's your choice that you have demonstrated. I feel like in this conversation to choose to view the other one in in a positive way. Yes. In that's, the face of things mm-hmm. that could easily be viewed in as as a negative. Mm-hmm. Right. And you've chosen to do that consistently to the point where you are, you are one flesh and, and you, it's a disciplined thing that you have done over time and you've not necessarily, um, just been swung by your emotion. Even, even you Cal as an emotional person, it doesn't seem to me like when you have a negative emotion, you let that run. I, 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 I feel like you take that and turn it into the selfless version of it versus the selfless selfish version and and that's just what i'm picking up in this conversation you may say that i'm i'm, I'm missing well, the boat, again but. what what people don't see and what i have found over time has helped me with that as being able to express to her those emotions good or bad does she listen to i mean with, oh gosh yeah without retribution sure without well sometimes it's a little retribution but that's what i need yeah i think the, the most powerful thing there's, there's two. One, that's not you. Well, that hits home. And the other one is I love you. And that, those two together just work miracles. Well, that's not you is good because sometimes we're going to do things that are out of character. Right. And if your spouse attributes that to your actual character versus saying, wait a minute, right. that's not you. There's a difference there, mm-hmm. and um, that's a decision because you could easily say, well, that's just who he is, mm-hmm. those negative things, and view him, begin to view him that way. You've chosen a different way of doing that, so much so that 
in your love for him, willing his good for his good, you can say to him, that's not you. And you know, it sounds like, that that resonates with him mm-hmm. and makes a difference. And you're doing it out of love for him versus your own. Mm-hmm. And, and showing him something maybe that he didn't know about himself, that he, something he's doing that he doesn't even realize that when people look at it or that they're saying something that I don't think you really want people to, th- you know, I know you don't mean that, but I don't think you want people to see that in you. I think that's love to me. Yeah, I, I, I there's mean, no doubt that that's, that's you willing their good and willing to pull them aside and say, Hey man, you got toilet paper stuck to your shoe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you want to go out like yeah. that. I'm right. telling you that because I love you. Yeah. If I didn't, I would just, Enjoy your humiliation right. publicly, <laughs> and and or call attention to it, <laughs> or call attention to it. That's right, and and that's mm-hmm. those are some of the things that happen, right? And what you say, Vicky, is you choose, you choose mm-hmm. to do that. Mm-hmm. Hey, you know, and like I said at the outset, we um, this still a marriage, uh, a, a crisis in the family that's going on in in our culture and, and in Christian homes that, you know, when you think of divorce, that, that can ripple through generations and, um, change the way you view love and people as a, as a child experiencing that, if that happens in your family. And then, you know, you think of couples who are together that both sets of their parents have been divorced and, you know, it's becomes, I guess more okay because it's been experienced so many times. And uh, I just feel like if we can have conversations about marriage and successful marriage, heck, I can tell you what not to do. I, I'm, I'm great at that. We, we got plenty of people with experience on that. I, I don't think we should be seeking marital advice from people who haven't demonstrated successes, successful marriages. And I think a lot of people give advice who've never really had a successful marriage. And I think we need to watch out for that. But um, a conversation around successful marriages and uh, I hope we can do this more and I appreciate you I really appreciate you being being willing to come in here and open the door to your marriage and that's not an easy thing to do and share that for the purposes of of God moving in other people's lives and in in their marriages and so I just can't thank you enough for coming here and sharing like you have well like we said early on it's not easy but it's worth and it's worth the results of listening, putting faith first, and enjoying each other for as long as you get. The joy that comes from that is well worth all the pain and injury and <laughs> hurt feelings and all those things. It's worth swallowing your pride. Oh, gosh, good point. To choose to see them as the good that they are because of what's going to come yeah. down the line. Thank you for being with us today on A Stronger Faith. If you feel like God may be calling you to share your own faith experiences, whether from a successful marriage or some other impactful experience, email us at connect at astrongerfaith.com or visit astrongerfaith.com to connect with us there. Also, if you know of someone that might benefit from today's conversation, share it with them. It might just be what God uses to move them toward peace. Until next time, I pray for peace and a stronger faith for you and those you love.